What's up everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Sit Down Saturday. Today's one I've been looking forward to. I've actually wanted to do this since last fall. I'm glad to see that most people enjoyed the Hot Rod Fans Toys to Car breakdown. It's nice when you put a lot of effort into something and it seems to be well received. So, awesome. There's a lot of people in the comments that said it's just not worth switching out my Takara one. And my score at the end was an 8 and a 7. So, that makes sense to me. Totally logical. <laughs> and there were other people that like, were trying to give Takara points for any old thing. <laughs> Takara has more vowels. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine. Whatever, look, you don't need my point system to make you feel good about your purchase. If you're happy, I'm happy for you. You know what I mean? Secondly, there was a YouTube poll that went up in the Cybertron Cafe of like people's preferred reviewers, and I, I got a lot of love in there. So I want to make sure that you guys know that I saw it and I appreciate it and I, I salute you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's nice to get love. And lastly, something that we need to talk about that's going to ruffle some feathers. But the truth is, it's time to have this conversation. I am part of a podcast called Nerd rage radio it's for mature listeners only that podcast has a patreon that we used for equipment and stuff and i've been very appreciative of anybody that's contributed i'm going to start doing skull face content there there's a one dollar tier a five dollar tier and a ten dollar tier all of those tiers get you something i don't do any of that like here's a buck and here's a thank you or here's a internet handshake or whatever i don't do that if any money that comes my way you get something in return a lot of people have been asking about non-transformer reviews a lot of that stuff is going to go on nerve rage patreon Patreon. A lot of people have been asking about uncut for dummies. That stuff's going to be on Patreon. That stuff is already on Patreon, actually. I'll be doing reactionary videos where when I get the toy out of the box, I get my very first impressions on how I feel about it. All that stuff will be over there. Along with all of the Nerd Rage bonus content, tons of audio stuff. It's... It's something else. So, I'm not asking for anybody to join up. I'm just letting you know it's available. Oh, and when you get there, at the goal, it says $5,000 a month. That's only because we couldn't fit enough zeros. We wanted to make it $5 trillion a month. It's just a joke. So, yeah. If you want extra stuff, that's where it's going to be for now. All the reviews and dummies and sit down Saturdays and all that stuff will still be here. I got diorama videos coming. An overview of it will be here. Detailed step-by-step -step processes will be on the Patreon, including, like, what brand of paint... I'm using and the exact color, all the technical stuff will all be over there. And there'll be contests and giveaways over there. I just want you to know what's happening. If you got some money in the couch and you don't know what to do with it, and you want to see some extra content, that's where you can send it. Now, moving on to today's discussion, we're going to be talking about some third-party companies that are missing. They're out there, cold, hungry, scared, and only you and your resources can provide information to help us find them. I'm kidding, but what we are going to talk about is are companies that we don't see anymore, possibly why, whether or not they're missed, etc. This is a part one of many, so I'll try to do them ever so often, like the past, present, and future videos, etc., etc., and I'm going to do a few that are gone, and then I'm going to do one that might be gone that we're not sure yet so let's begin and we're gonna start with art feather art feather was a company that we first saw rise in 2012 they released a bumblebee which was based on the classics design but it incorporated the Volkswagen Beetle look a lot of people appreciated this because with classics one of the things that often turned people away was it was close enough to make you know who the character was but at the same time far enough away where it became frustrating and they offered a Volkswagen Beetle with pretty much the same engineer as the classics Bumblebee. And this was pretty well received. The materials were praised. The paint was praised. It was surprisingly good packaging at the time. And then they released a gold bug version of it, which I believe came with a chip chase. And I know friends of mine that were contemplating getting one just to get a chip chase before we started getting chip chase from Bad Cube and Takara. However, we didn't see much from Art Feather afterwards. And I was always confused by this because it seemed like they sold well. They were fairly well received, but they they just sort of faded into obscurity and were swallowed up by the black hole. So if you've seen them, contact someone. Not me, but someone. Next up on our list is BTS. The interesting thing about this BTS is that they had a really strong reputation, and I'm not really sure on what, to be honest, but they started off with upgrade kits, trailers for primes, accessory kits, and this was well received because a lot of people wanted trailers for their classics prime. A lot of these early third-party companies got a lot of legs from making upgrades or elements for your classics collection that were really needed. Fans Project, BTS, Art Feather, etc. Like a lot of these early companies started that way. Now they got their start in 2009 and they released their first full figure which was Sonicron. Surprisingly enough, this was kind of well received at the time. I think it might have been on a Transformers hype train, especially in regards to third party because as the years went on, it ended up not being remembered as fondly to a point where BBTS started offering it for like a holiday sale. I think for $6.99 and one Arby's coupon in a Marlboro 
Federal Light, you could get a Sonicron. I'm pretty sure that was the deal. You had to mail in the coupon to Arby's and the Marlboro Light separately. It was a there was a lot of logistics to it, so many people didn't take advantage of it, but it was very cheap. They also released tape sets, a Rumble and Frenzy that were really well received at the time, but by today's standards look pretty ridiculous. And the same thing goes for their Ravage and Rat Bat. Now I actually had the opportunity to look at this Ravage and Rat Bat set because my oldest daughter used to be a mega Transformer fan before Age of Extinction ruined it all for. Her. And Ravage was one of her favorite characters. So she actually had this set and I messed with it and it was very flimsy. Things had a tendency to fall apart while messing with it, but you could see that there was real potential in terms of where this company could go for the time that they were making this product. Now I say that to say this. Supposedly they had a blaster coming, but but I remember this distinctly. They teased an overlord and people lost their minds. People were head over heels in love with the idea because at the time, and you have to understand, this was years ago and the idea of getting an overlord seemed so far-fetched. Now we have Hasbro overlords, MMC overlords, Fans Hobby overlords. We have more overlords than you can shake a stick at. But at the time, it seemed shockingly bizarre, but exciting, especially for the more niche character fan. I don't remember what the price tag was for this thing, but when the price tag surfaced, I want to say it was like close to $300, if not more. And although I think we ended up seeing renders for this, it never came to fruition because I don't think that the market at the time was ready to invest that sort of money into a piece like this. It's funny because the market has evolved now and $300 seems cheap by some standards and of course still expensive by others. But I think this overlord was the nail in their coffin. I think this was an idea of your eyes being too big for your stomach with your eyes being your ambition and your stomach being the current market. And that was the end of them. But if you've seen them, clip your Arby's coupon, run down to your local community college and find someone smoking the Marlboro Light, ask if you can borrow one and send both the coupon and the Marlboro Light to someone that can help. That person is also not me, but someone, someone can. Next up on our list is iGear. What's interesting about this one is that iGear for a time was one of the major players. Like today when people talk about major players, they talk about fast toys, they talk about make toys, they talk about MMC. I think they're starting to talk about Zeta, which I've been preaching for a while, but it takes a minute for some folks to catch up. But back in the day, iGear was one of those names that was mentioned quite often. Now we start to see them sort of make an impact around 2010, I think. And we saw their Delicate Warrior, which was an RC. There was like a whole bunch of RCs at the time and it was confusing because the names were a little bizarre and it was actually one of the challenging choices to make, not unlike today. And then they had some KO tendency stuff. They had a Shattered Glass Prime, they had the cone heads for MPs, they also had a G1 style B, which I actually have, and they had a Huffer and that was sort of their early era. And then they kind of went through their second phase, which was mainly UFO and Sea Spray and these were big improvements and for a lot of times it's interesting, not only these two, but also their Ironhide and Ratchet. Their Ironhide, which I still think the chest proportions look better than the Takara. And their Beachcomber ended up becoming stand-ins for most people's MP shells for quite some time if you've been in the game long enough. They released the Swerve and Gears, which were always tough nuts to swallow, look ridiculous, and Swerve had the plastic of a strong salmon. Salmon. But their reputation did begin to tank around this time. Now, one of the problems that I think third-party companies face is when they start going balls to the wall with with repaints. And we saw this with iGear. They did a Seekers run. They did the main three. They did the secondary three. And I got news for you. I had the pleasure of sharing a drink with the gentleman that designed these. And at the time, he showed me plans for all of them. They were going to do Rainmakers, Predators. Like, they had tons of repaints lined up for this mold. And people get burned out by a mold, especially when the mold is fetching a fair dollar. Now, these were kind of IDW inspired, so there was an allure there. Thanks to John Garinger, I had the opportunity to check out the Thundercracker, which I still have. And they were fine. Nothing to write home about, but they were, they would do the job. The Thundercracker should have came with a dog, but that's a side story. But people got burned out by the mold, and we saw not much else from this company ever since. Now, just recently, they did tease a runabout and run em up. I don't know if this will ever see the light of day. The last design I remember seeing prior to the runabout and run em up that we never really saw was their Presser, which was an impactor. It was very exciting at the time. It probably wouldn't stand up today because MMC did a knockout job with their impactor. But at the time, it was very exciting, but we never saw it. Next on our list is probably the most famous fall ever in third party, which is Impossible Toys. Or as my buddy T2RX6 says, Impossible to Love Toys, which is...
which is funny, but they have a pretty long history. They did tons of little stuff like spikes and spark plugs and crimzeeks and all that kind of stuff and an animated little figure of a human character, but they also did an RC mold, which I never messed with, but I heard wasn't great. And they did an Alicon, and then they kind of found their niche in the movie stuff that nobody was going to make. Non-transforming stuff like Alpha Trion, Arbulus, Kranix, Quintessons, etc. And those Quintessons still fetch a fair price. And I still have them in my collection, and they look pretty good. They really hold up. Obviously, there's not a whole lot of engineering involved, and some of my faces still fall off. But sculpt-wise and paint-wise, they still do a pretty good job. But then they fell into the repaint pit also, and they started doing Tetra Jets. And I have all seven. And then they did a slew of bumblebees. We had white ones, blue ones, yellow ones, red ones, green ones, orange ones. Like, they did the whole Crayola box, the 64 pack for these little bumblebee molds. And I want to say they were like 40 or 50 bucks a piece at first. However, I know at the end you could buy a whole set for I think 20 bucks, a miscellaneous drawer organizer that would hold like your pens and scotch tape and that sort of stuff in your office, and five prize tickets from Chuck E. Cheese. They were strict on that though, not four. You know, they everything has value. So five, the drawer organizer, and 20 bucks is how I think at the end it, it went. And Impossible Toys is also one of the few companies that publicly came out and said, we are closing our doors. Thanks for the run. Didn't work out. Thanks for the good times. But I think that they made their impact. Like, I think if you were to write a book on third party history, you'd have to mention them. Like, they, they did some work that's still holding up. I, it's funny, like, Fans Project was considered the, the, the holy grail of third party for a long time. I barely have any Fans Project pieces in my current collection. I still have tons of Impossible Toys stuff. It's interesting. Impossible Toys was always seen as, like, the the lowest common denominator third-party company at the time. It's interesting how history writes itself. Last up on our list, and I'm mentioning this company because I don't know where they're at, G Creation. Started off with a Dinobot set that wasn't the best thing I've ever looked at, but had real merit and potential for a first company's effort, along with really cool design aesthetic. And then we saw that continue to an IDW Prime, which is still one of my favorite figures in my collection, even though it's broken. They followed this up with the Hanzo and Rebel, their Six Shot and Prowl masterpiece scale IDW inspired designs which look great and are pretty well made. This company struggled with engineering a little bit, making it fun and enjoyable, but they didn't struggle in the sculpt department. Their sculpts were fantastic. But they also teased an Ultra Magnus Drift Starscream, I believe, and Megatron from IDW, and we never saw those. The problem I think that this company faced was everything that they released for the most part had outstanding competition. So Toy World had a Dinobot set at the time. Fans Toys had a Dinobot set at the time. Giga Power still has a Dinobot set in the works. Dinobots were everywhere. Where Fans Project had a Dinobot set at the time. Final Dinobots were everywhere, so they were competing in a pot. Six Shot, same way. DX9 had a Masterpiece Style 1 coming. Fans Toys had a Masterpiece Style 1 coming. They did their Prime. Generation Toy did their Prime. So I'm not sure what the state of G Creations is anymore. I feel like they've been very quiet. But I hope that they come back because I think they make a really good product. I really like their Six Shot. I really like their Prime. I really like their Prowl. But I haven't seen them recently. So if you've seen them, contact Toy World and let them know that their combiner for the Dinobots also should never have happened, but doesn't look as good as the G Creations one. And then contact someone who can help, because that's important. So yeah, that'll do it. That's our first installment of this series. Hope you enjoy it. We got more coming. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, take care.